Hey y'all, this is Chris Hicks and welcome to the Southern Rock Insider. If you like what you see, please hit subscribe and click the notification bell. It's time to rock Southern style. The Southern Rock Insider. Hello everybody, I'm Kyler Mosley uh, filling in for Chris Hicks on the Southern Rock Insider here with y'all. Uh, Chris is out on the road with some Marshall Tucker out on the West Coast and they decided to pick out a better looking host to uh, handle this. So here I am, folks. I'm usually <laughs> I'm usually on the radio, so but y'all get to see the TV YouTube version of him now. So anyway, I want to welcome Mr. Eddie Stone, a longtime musician out of the Macon Warner Robins area. Longtime friend. Longtime friend. Um, he's got some stories that we're gonna share with y'all today. Um, he's played with uh, quite a bunch of folks, but I want to go all the way back to pre-Roundhouse days, man. Tell us how you got started. Did you see Ed Sullivan? I Beatles, did. Uh, I did. Beatles? I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and then there was a guy named Zeke Zerngable that I was in my first band with. We went to school together, went to Rumble at the time, Rumble Junior High, and uh, he played guitar and I played guitar and we watched the Beatles and we had this band. We used to play play the skate rinks. It's up fifty bucks a night, big money, you know. Okay. Zeke went on to play with um, Warren Zivon. There's a bunch of videos of him on YouTube playing with Warren. Okay. And uh, you know, we just first it was the Beatles, then it was the Stones and the Monkeys, and then the then the Motown started creeping in, and then the Soul started creeping in. Mainly because if you were going to play, you had to, in, in, in middle Georgia area, you had to be able to play all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They wanted to hear everything, you know. And so. Well, I guess my first run in was with you when I was a teenager was seeing like Roundhouse out in on the uh, Houston County Fairgrounds and y'all and Eric Quincy Tate and I think Moses Finest and then of course working with the Brooks Brothers, you know, we opened shows for y'all. Yeah, we did a lot of stuff, Tim and Greg mm -hmm. and, and I did a lot of stuff. Yeah, and I know from that, say, 74, 5 era to 85 era, between y'all and then y'all becoming Doc Holliday, we, you know, we were lucky that we had, you know, y'all, Stillwater, Tall Dogs, uh, Sea Level, Grinder Switch. We had five or six bands around here that we could really enjoy some serious southern rock and blues stuff from and no, we didn't play by the rules that's for sure <laughs> and y'all carried the southern rock banner off in the europe even more so than probably the rest of the, any of the rest of the bands did around here huh? we did we, we we were blessed we had it we had a pretty much a career in scandinavia and europe and places and it was it was it was, it was nice and then you mentioned grinder switch they were like our godfathers so to speak you know the they needed a they needed a PA system to play a lot of places they played because they they weren't on tour and so we played with them and we said who owns that PA system well we do he said, who owns them lights well, we do cancel the rest of those top forty gigs you got you're going out with us you know so that's what we did we were grinder switches opening act and provided the sound well, for I know them. from us dealings with. You know, Joe Dan, Drew, and the guys, you know, a bunch of really nice, nice guys, man, out there. And it was great. And then in the end, when, when Drew was trying to resurrect Grinder Switch after Stephen had passed, he called me. And we did yeah, actually did we actually did an album called The Ghost Train to Georgia. We did some gigs and had a great time, you know. Okay. Well, now, um, did you and Bruce pretty much start? Uh, Doc Holiday or Roundhouse together. Bruce started Roundhouse, and we're speaking to Bruce Brookshire. That's right. We hope to also get on the on our uh, Southern Rock Insider as well. Here, Bruce started Roundhouse with his brother Bob. By the time I got drafted in the service, and by the time I got drafted, I was playing in a band. Uh, we called it Stage Band because that's what we did. It was me and Rob Walker, and Mike Causey, and C.B. Lacey. Now, was this part of the Follies thing? This yeah. was the Follies thing. This was a legendary story. And like Danny Ford was the bass player for okay. it, who at the same time was becoming the bass player at the Roundhouse. So it was all intertwined. And and we we did a lot of gigs. After I got out of the service, actually even before I got out of the service, that's how I'm going to leave, I came in and started playing with Bruce, and we went out and opened for Wet Willie, opened for... Uh, Eric Quincy Tate, 
and did a few things like that. And then I had to go back. I had 13 months to do in the service left. I had to go back and do that. So that was my, that was the little carrot in front of the donkey that get me, get me home. And we got home, we picked up and started again. And it, uh, at this time, Stillwater had already become Stillwater and they were, they had a good bit of notoriety. Roundhouse had had a good bit of notoriety playing down south with opening show, a lot of shows for Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, uh, Wet Willie, a bunch of shows like that. So we always had that to fall back on. It didn't pay anything, but it was always musically inspiring to do that. And uh, well, now, didn't Molly Hatchett's uh, Pat Armstrong eventually help y'all get a record deal? With well, no, he wanted to. He wanted us to sign with him really bad. We, we had meetings, we had all kind of things, and we were watching Molly Hatchet, and we just kind of thought, I don't know if there's any room for yeah. us here, you know? And in the meantime, there was some guys in North Carolina called Bill Kane, CMC Productions. They, la they later founded CMC Records, which was a big deal for a long time. And Bill Kane was managing Nantucket at that time. And he came to see us, and he said, I like y'all. And then, okay, and what's that mean? You know, he said, well, we're gonna start playing and doing some things. And so, even though we didn't quite go as fast as we would have gone, had we gone with Pat, maybe, but... Uh, well, he did get y'all hooked up with Tom Allen, right? The producer. Well, that was... Th no. That's that's another side story. Pretty good name that's another there, side story. So. But yes, Tom Allen was. We got hooked up with him because he produced one of Nantucket's albums. Nantucket was on Epic, and they originally, someone at Epic wanted Tom Allen to produce Wet Will, which I don't know how that would have gone. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, been, you know, I know about and, Allen because of Judas Priest. Well, that's right, and and um, and, and and Pat Travers and Travers, and yeah, and some yeah. of the other. But Tom said, "I got a couple of bands that I think Tom Allen might work real good with." So he produced mm -hmm. the Nantucket record, I guess, "Long Way to the Top." And then when we signed with A and M, it was the first choice because in our bat, we had the Southern. We wanted what he did to Judas Priest to go with it. We we just didn't want to be uh, a goat rope and boogie band as the, as right, the, yeah, the, yeah. they, they, they called us back then. Y'all did have a harder edge, even though with the country, you know, chicken picking stuff that, that Bruce was always so good at. Man, y'all did have a little bit more of a edge to y'all, you know. We did, band, but so. but you know that was the first thing when we first started being looked at by record companies, and they said, guys. What kind of band do y'all want to be? You give me a demo tape, it's got a funk song, it's got a southern song, it's got a heavy metal song. Well, and then you sang more the country. And I was singing all the country, the country type stuff. stuff yeah. so. And uh, he said, y'all got to concentrate. Y'all got to be somebody. <laughs> you know? So, okay. Well, we want y'all to be a southern band. Well, you've done uh, some solo records here at the Capricorn facilities. Back I when did. Was, when it was Phoenix. It was Phoenix, and I actually did the last session here before they literally started pulling the wires out, before mm -hmm. it was rescued later on. Mm -hmm. We did uh, three songs off of my uh, Eddie Stone and Friends CD that was for Sony in Europe, and one of them wound up being on a Doc Holiday album. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, we had... Uh, I had B.B. Borden in here playing. I had Chris in here playing. and uh, Ken Wynn, I think. So. Ken Wynn, uh, Phil Palmer. Uh, some good local players for all, Paul the, Hornsby. all them people out there in the world that don't know who we're talking about. Some of these guys are real hot shots around town. So Played play with Phil Palmer for a lot of years. Played with Ken Wynn for a lot of years. That's two of, two of the best guitarists ever reared their head in Macon, Georgia. So. And I, I, I did those records here, and that was a great thing. I learned... I already knew how to make albums under the direction of somebody, but I learned how to, all of a sudden, I was a guy who had to tell somebody what to do and how to do it. And well, with Skip Slaughter, I'm sure that went. Well, Skip's the one that took me in the corner and said, hey, yeah. you're going to have to grab this bull by the horns. It's your bull. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So I, I learned a lot, got a lot done. The record came out and did good. Did a couple of solo tours in Europe. Did a... 
with a German Southern rock band that always opened for Doc Holliday called Lizard. And I had all them boys playing with me on the tour over there. That was, mm -hmm. that was a good thing. I know from talking to Scott Pallant, he was one of y'all's crew members, man. Y'all did a show in Berlin for over a million people. That was the Y2K show. And that's a that's a nice large crowd to be gathered. We've done some some pretty <laughs> large ones. Doc Holliday is famous for getting in on some of the big ones. We did uh, the uh, probably the most popular festival in the Europe and Scandinavia ever called Sweden Rock Festival. It's usually you know 150 200 thousand people every year, and so Doc Holliday has been blessed. We've done four or five Sweden Rock festivals. That's got to be a thrill, man, to go out there and play for that many folks. I went with the new Doc Holiday band on the last one. It it got their attention real quick when there was about 40,000 people when we hit the first note. <laughs> so tell us about the new Doc Holiday, man. I know Bruce is kind of semi-retired. Bruce, Bruce is not able to go out and do the things that he would like to do, and so he gave me a blessing to go out and keep, keep the band alive. Mm -hmm. So I've got some young guys. I call them young. They're in their 40s and close to 50s, they're young to me, and a couple of real hot shot guitar players. One one, one of them did a, a, about a three year stand with Doc Holliday before. He's okay. named Tim Elliott. And, uh, you know, Michael, long haired guy that plays guitar for me, he's amazing. He's, uh, you just, he's one of these guys that you need to keep a recorder going at all times because you don't know what's coming out. He'll play a riff. Like, what was that? I don't know. I said, well, I do now. And we had already gotten everything pretty much written for the for a new Doc Holiday record when I come down with the COVID. And that, of course, that took a long time. And then when I started getting well, we started getting ready to. I said, well, we're gonna go in the studio. We're gonna we're gonna get this done. Danged if my drummer didn't get it, and he'd been sick about three and a half weeks with pneumonia from it. So, so we're just kind of. Well, you yeah, got a holding pattern. You got a couple other things going on. I know you do some gigs with Wet Willie now. I am the the honorary Hall brother, or you know, I I got a here's I wore this shirt here. This is a good one. This one was uh, Memorial. Uh, is it, no, June June twelfth. Uh, Wet Willie, Travis Womack, that used to be yeah, on okay. Capricorn. Oh, yeah. Travis wrote the song that. Doc Holiday did that was probably well best known around here called Keep On Running. Everybody thought we wrote that, but that was his. Mm -hmm. And then Otis was there. We had a good good old time that night. And, mm -hmm. and that the guy that put this show on is the guy that owned Broadway Studios who put Outlaws in the studio first, put uh Skinner in the studio before the Swampers did. Mm -hmm. And uh then he put us in the studio. So and you do the has y'all do the has beens? We do the has beens with the Stillwater guys. That's kind of a lot of fun. That's uh, uh, four of the guys from Stillwater and me, and we do the stuff we grew up playing. A lot of Almond Brothers, a lot of Doobie Brothers, a lot of Motown. We're gonna do some Eagles stuff. There's a lot of Eagles stuff, yeah. and just have they're having fun. Now they're having fun. Make a little spin. CB gets CB gets back behind the drums and plays drums again, which he did yeah. for the first two Stillwater albums. And I, I play a lot of I play a lot of wet Willie dates. Well, as many dates as we can have. COVID took a yeah. kind of a, a we had a weekend warrior tour as we call it Thursday through Sunday, a couple times a month with ARS and small theaters, and that that got eighty sixth and hadn't come back yet. So mm -hmm. we'd really like to get that one back going again. Yeah, maybe things get rolling again. Huh? And we had the Doc Holiday tour in Europe that was scheduled and. That got knocked out of clouds, but maybe maybe that'll come back in as soon as we get where we can go. You know, they don't, they don't want us vile Americans over there <laughs> infecting them over there. No, so. no variants. I mean, we don't need no more variants. That's true. Uh, well, brother, we always ask people uh, tell us a crazy road story, man. If it's and we might have to edit parts of it out, but we'll leave that up to you. What you tell us? Well, you know, I guess probably the most famous one involves Alan Walden too. And we were playing, it was my birthday weekend and we were playing at the, um, gosh, not the Orpheum, but whatever that was called in New York. My COVID brain still gets on me. 
but it's a place like the Fox Theater that everybody played, and we were with the Outlaws there for two nights. Well, the Outlaws had a song on their album called Angels Ride on the Ghost Riders album. Well, Hell's Angels took uh, a little, That's they didn't care for it much. Cause yeah. it, it took the fence. It, huh? it, well, yeah, well, because it's Angels Hide, and they don't hide from nothing. Yeah. And we got done with our first, our set the first night. And I looked, I was going upstairs to the dressing rooms and coming through the door were five of the biggest guys I've ever seen in my life. One with a hook in his arm and the guy had an Uzi in the hook. And he said, does he want up? And he said, no. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> and what had happened was, is they went in and took over the theater and the Palladium is what it was and they took it over and they said we're not going to have this they were toting guns and said that, and, and Alan's freaking out and everybody's freaking out everybody's up in our dressing room hiding and they're down there with Huey and they're giving him a once over and uh <laughs> he's having to write out the lyrics for him huh? <laughs> he had to write the lyrics out <laughs> And we had to do it. And Alan said, well, we'll fix this. Yeah. We just won't do this song yeah. tomorrow night. And he said, oh, yes, you're going to do it. But you're going to say Angels Ride every time it says Angels Hide. And you better not mess it up. <laughs> and they're sitting there at the mixing board mm -hmm. with guns and suits and mm -hmm. everything in there. And I told the cops the first night, I said, man, Y'all got to do something about this. He says, y'all do something about it. We got to live here with them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was, it was a kind of a scary thing. I was not envying Huey Thomason at all uh, at understand. that point. Definitely understand. That one was uh, it. And then the, the morning when we woke up in Arizona to our bus burning to the ground when we were on tour with April Wine at Loverboy. It, uh, we lost our bus in about 14 minutes with all our clothes and a few guitars and, and that that got our attention pretty good yeah, I'm sure. so, sure. I don't know they say we ought to write a book so I, I'm I'm kind of like Greg's Greg told Red Dog he says you could have waited till a few people died before you wrote that book you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I might have to wait a while before we can mm -hmm. We can write the book. All right. Speaking of opening bands, you know, is anybody open for y'all and, and just went on to bigger and better things and vice versa, man? I mean, did y'all... Uh, Hootie and the Blowfish opened for us two or three times around the South Carolina area. And um, Stevie Ray Vaughan didn't open, but he said he wished he had because he played Raleigh with us on his first tour. And, of course, that Raleigh, North Carolina was like our, our second home and we had a big outdoor festival and I felt pretty bad that we're still yelling for Doc Holliday through the first couple of blues tunes that Stevie, that Stevie was doing. But he got it back together and when he had Voodoo Child, he had his, he had his strut going. Yeah, sure, <laughs> right. yeah. but, but we opened for everybody from David Allen Coe to Black Sabbath, yeah. you know. Uh, we did the Black Sabbath Mob Rules Tour. We opened for Molly Hatchet, we opened for the Outlaws, we opened for all the Southern bands, but we also opened for uh, Scorpions, we opened for uh, April Wine, Loverboy, Pat Travers, uh, just about, you name it, you know, we, we, we set foot on stage with them and they told us to go, you know, and then first time I saw, uh, we played with David Allen Coe, Warren Haynes was playing with him, he had a strat on up here about round his neck, looked like a ukulele hanging there. And uh, cause I mean, we were opening for Wet Willie during the dripping wet phase. And I mean, Jimmy would just go out there and run you over. I mean, even Jimmy now, it's almost 70 years old, of embarrassed folks out there. As, as, he will wear you out. As good as he is. So. He he does not quit. And we, we, we got that. You learn two things if you were in a, a Southern band in, in the Georgia area here, you, you were good friends with everybody, 
and you, <coughs> excuse me, you, you looked after each other. You are uh, <coughs> all one big family. And that's what we learned. Yeah, I think that's carried over too. Some of the young guys are bringing that along and it's, it's good to see them carrying on the uh, what got started 50 years ago. Yeah, and, and, and I'm seeing some of that. We did a we did a Blackberry Smoke show about three or four years ago and they were... Yeah, they're definitely carrying the banner. They're carrying now. the banner and they were so nice and then Charlie looked at me and he says, you don't know me. And I said, I, I you look familiar. I said, you know, he says, we open for y'all the night after y'all played the Omni with Black Sabbath and he was in a heavy metal band. He says, we didn't think y'all deserved to be there. And we played Rumors, which was a big rock club in Atlanta the next night before we picked the tour back up. And uh, I said, what happened? He said, well, we were gonna blow y'all off the stage. And I said, how'd that work for you? He said, not too good. <laughs> There's a big difference between 200 and 20,000. And that's what y'all were used to seeing. Mm -hmm. He said, it was like a, it was like being on the wrong end of a bowling alley when y'all came on the stage. <laughs> well, Eddie, it's been great having you here with us. Man. I appreciate I this. I'm information and telling your story. And uh, I know you've been making music over 50 years now, man. I hope it continues. I'm going to give it a try. I just wish my buddy Chris had been here because uh, we well, go he away. Wouldn't made, he wouldn't have made us no better looking, though. See? No, I know that. But, you know, it, it might have been. Well, he might could have told some of them stories that had to be edited out, you know. <laughs> but I really appreciate y'all having me here. This is uh, part of my upbringing. You know, my, my brother was Bobby Whitlock's road manager for two albums here, so I got to see some things go on, you know. He was cutting in the day when, on one of the albums, Skinner was doing Give Me Back My Bullets at night, and the other album, the brothers were doing an album. So, and it was like, we'd come in in the morning and they were just leaving after the all-nighter, you know. Might be some of the stories you better not tell. You can't <laughs> tell those stories, except i leave you with this. Don't drink JMO's tea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. We're going to roll it up here and say good, our goodbyes for this episode of the Southern Rock Insider. I'm Connor Mosley, and I hope you'll spread the word out there to join us. And, uh, keep your ears and eyes open. Have some fun. There you Enjoy go. Enjoy Southern Rock and Roll and kick ass. Thanks for watching this episode of Southern Rock Insider. Please hit subscribe and click the notification bell so you won't miss a single episode. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please respond below, or you can email us at southernrockinsider at gmail.com. This is your Southern Rock Insider, Chris Hicks, and thanks again for watching. Southern Rock Insider.